hydrangea pruning. Um, one of the things that I do wanted to say is hydrangeas right now is uh, we are coming, we have lots of lots of hydrangeas. So we are gonna be, um, I was trying to research for how to simplify, is one hour, what, what to say, what not to say. And then I thought, well, you know what? Things are getting like more and more, we have more species, more cultivars, a little bit more variation in different things. So I am gonna stick with my uh, philosophy of trying to do a general pruning that will cover all of the hydrangeas and then I do a little bit of specific. But um, this is the best approach I could find. And I'm still kind of like uh, believing that is the right approach. So- um, Hey, this, Elizabeth, real quick yeah. before, before I let you go on, forgive me for jumping in. Um, you guys, if you didn't receive the outline, it is on our website. So go to the uh, go to slopegardens.com. You're gonna go to the what's happening tab, and then you're gonna click on webinars. And if you scroll down, you should be able to see it on a full size computer. It says see this week's webinar outline, and it's there. So that should be that should be a little bit easier for you to find. And then Elizabeth, I just want to make sure you know that your screen is black and blank on our end. So if there's a title page, we we aren't able to see it. Oh, okay. So I guess I have to stop the share and start all over again. Um, let me see. Is that showing now? It is. Okay, perfect. Is Wait, it just went away again. Whatever it is that you just did, it it disappeared. Oh. But maybe as you move forward, I'm not sure. Okay, so um, let me, hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm so trying to some, somebody mentioned um if you start your slideshow first and then you share the screen, maybe then we'd be able to see it. I'm not, I'm the worst techie ever, so. Okay, let me see. Um, okay. So I'm here. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna go with this one. So now it's showing? Now it is showing. Okay. So I am gonna, um, I have never done it like this, so I have to figure it out how to start the, um, you may have to just click on each individual sh slide instead of the slideshow, but there should be a slideshow tab on there. Yeah. Um, I, um, let's see here. We'll click on home. And then slideshow over to your right. Over to your right, there you go. Uh, not that far, like right in the middle, it says slideshow right under where it says copy of hydrangea. Yep. One more. There you go. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> and then play from start. Okay. All right. I will sign okay. off. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that, people. I have to, I forget that now I have to download because I have too many slideshows. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, hydrangea species. So one of the things is, if this is an overall and um, most probably you're gonna feel really complicated with all the things I'm gonna say, 
Um, but one of the things that I try to do is do a lot of clarification of what I see in the internet, what I see with my experience. So the hydrangea microphylla uh, is the most common hydrangea. Um, they do have new uh, cultivars of this species, um, which they produce flowers also um, later on in the season. So they produce flowers early in the season and then later on in a late summer, early fall. So those are the new cultivars, the endless summer series and less than series. Other than that, we have the big leaf hydrangea that is really strong, um, is the ones that you can uh, have the blue flowers, the pink flowers, um, is the most common one. Then we have the hydrangea paniculata. The paniculata is um, the panicle hydrangea, um, is one that is also really common uh, because it's really strong, is the one that also can hold the flowers up, which is one of the problems with these big, beautiful flowers. Um, is one of the plants that are like in the bigger side of the spectrum. Uh, this is also used to generate the tree a hydrangea. So that means you're gonna have a trunk and then your hydrangea will come from there. Um, then you have the serrata. This is more like in the East Coast type of hydrangea, so you don't see it much here, um, but it exists and is there, and you do have a lot of those uh, flat flowers. They are not surrounded or conical. Um, then we have the arborescence. Arborescence is what one of them that they call the Annabelles, and those are one of the native hydrangeas, meaning they are from the US. Um, so they have these rounded white flowers and they have some now that are like um, a little bit in the pinkish. Um, the Cursifolia is also a native hydrangea from US. Um, and this hydrangea is uh, really different than the other hydrangeas in the look of the leaves. They are the oak leaf hydrangea because the leaf looks like an oak leaf. It's pretty big. It's really good for use for texture as a background uh, plant uh, because the leaves are pretty big. Um, and then we have the hydrangea uh, petiolaris that is the climbing hydrangea. So the reason why I'm saying this is because instead of putting like needs and um, what the plant needs or what they like, I am gonna go with, okay, these are the species and maybe highlight a little bit on, on certain species. So we are, you know, doing our climate change or the, we have to adjust our watering. So one of the things is um, the, which plants are more drought than other ones. In general, I would say hydrangeas are pretty drought tolerant. So any plant that is planted, like newly planted, they are gonna require a lot of water in the first year. So pretty much frequent watering. But I can say that um, in my experience, you can make a hydrangea go towards being a drought tolerant hydrangea. In this species, the most drought tolerant hydrangea will be uh, the paniculata and the cursifolia. They are pretty good at drought tolerance. You can even get your hydrangea to be one watering a, uh, a week. So that is pretty, uh, pretty good. So in this case, these big hydrangeas, you want to do deep watering. Um, the the other thing about hydrangeas that I want people to be mindful of is how high they grow. I do have to say that uh, as a designer, I realize that a lot of the times when I do my pruning, a lot of the times uh, people is, can you just cut the hydrangeas? There is such a thing about the wrong plant for the wrong space when it comes to hydrangeas. Because if you are picking up hydrangea that grows really big, like the paniculata and the decursifolia, you are going to have to prune the flowers and that is gonna generate 
a set of problems because then the shoots, they are gonna shoot out even more and then you are gonna be cutting more and then they become this huge fight. The plant is not gonna look good. The plant is not gonna flower for you. So the first thing is pick the right plant for the space, meaning size. They can be hydrangeas in general, they can be five, six, seven, eight feet tall. And the climbing hydrangea can go to 14, 20 feet. So it's really important that you realize that no all hydrangeas are small. The new series uh, of the hydrangeas, uh, the endless summer, the less dance, and the tough stuff, um, they are in the small size, but the small size hydrangeas are three feet tall. So just keep that in mind because it's, it's not easy to keep them contained and still flowering. So the other thing is how much sun and shade they like. So we know the hydrangeas, they are one of these plants that we use in spaces where um, they, um, they are, have filters on. So they are kind of like shade, half shade, summer, uh, uh, sorry, uh, early morning sun. A lot of these hydrangeas can tolerate that and they love that. However, I do have to say that the two hydrangeas that can tolerate heat and can tolerate full sun are the paniculata and the cursifolia. They do like it, they do, they thrive on it, um, and they grow really well. So that is a good thing to, I mean, that is something that I would like uh, to know if I am selecting hydrangeas. Um, the climbing hydrangea, the one thing about the climbing hydrangea I will say is they are strong growers. You do need to realize that the climbing hydrangea will grow a, like 14, 20 feet tall and wide and they, they, need, they need a structure. These plants, if you give them a structure, they, you will be able to prune them and set them to grow much better. Um, so the hydrangea, usually when you are searching about like, okay, how do I'm gonna start my pruning? Um, so one of the things that you will hear everywhere uh, is that you have the difference between the hydrangeas is the ones that produce in old wood, the flowers, and that they want to produce the flowers in the new wood. So here I'm giving you the, the well, in your uh, outline also you have it. And here I'm giving it to you. So you have in the old wood, the microphylla, the serrata, the cursifolia, the petiolaris, all of them produce in the old wood, which means like my flower was a, is the wood that grow, grew last year. So 2022, that is where the flower bud was. Um, so, and I'm gonna explain that a little bit more. Hydrangea that producing the new wood is the paniculata and the arborescence. Now, these new hydrangeas that are coming out, the ones that produce twice a year, they are the ones that produce in the new and in the old wood. So those are the microphylas, the endless summer series, the less dance and the tough stuff. So this is gonna confuse a little bit your two groups and how to prune, but at the end, I'm gonna totally clarify it to you. Um, now, what is new and what is old? So the new wood, is, is, is not a simple rule of thumb. And that is when you're gonna feel that everything is gonna become complicated in this talk, but if you, but then I clarified it. So it's not an easy, oh, it's this color, because some of them, how you can see, are green. So in this case, that this arrow is showing you the new wood, the ones that are like green, or some of them, they are really dark brown. And those are the new wood. The old wood usually, usually is um, like this pale beige uh, color. Um, only it is a little bit different uh, in the in the cursifolia. But it, so what I'm trying to say with these slides is new and old 
is um, not so easy to identify um, by the color. Um, it's more like by you dealing with your hydrangea is that you realize what is an old cane and what is a new cane. Um, I think that between new and old, what is more important is that you start realizing what is strong and what is weak. And I will explain that later. So now the plant cycle. The plant cycle is important for the care of the plant and for the pruning of the plant. And this is gonna stop with all this mystification on pruning in fall. Um, so in a spring, let's start in the spring because it's you know, how the year starts. So in a spring, the plant is growing. The plant is growing and the first growth that they have is coming from all the uh, nutrient uh, stored in fall. So anything that happens in fall is going to show in a spring. So if, it, if in fall, I went and cut my water way before because it rained in the middle of fall or early fall, and then I decided, you know what, I'm not going to water it anymore. You are going to see that in the next spring. Um, so it's really important that you get that connection going. So in a spring, what the plant is doing is growing. So that is everything that is doing. They are just shooting out from um, the dormancy. In summer, there are two really important things that are happening. In summer, they are producing the blooms. So usually is you know June or something like that. Um, and then later the later bloomers they produce later, but some of them are producing the, the first blooms in summer. So also um, they are producing the buds, the flowering buds, and I put it in quotes in everywhere you see it. Why? Because they are not they are not really flowering buds. Those are vegetative buds. That means they are growing the green. However, they have the the cell that has uh, that is going to produce the flower inside. But those are really, we're going to call it flowering buds because at the end of the day, after they grow, the flower is going to come out in that point. So in summer, usually between June and July, you are going to start seeing those flowering buds. So that is important to have in mind. And I'm going to go back to that in a second. So then comes fall. Fall, again, with a new series of uh, hydrangeas, some of them are going to start falling, uh, start going to um, produce flowers, the second set of flowers. Uh, some of them are going to produce, the late bloomers are going to start producing the flowering buds. And then, um, and, but the other thing that they do is do the winter preparation. And that means the, the plants, uh, the deciduous plants release a hormone um, that helps the plant not to get like frozen, like the ice cube frozen in, uh, because they have water in, uh, in the canes. So this preparation is actually kind of like important for these plants. And, um, and also they start pruning the nutrient stored in the um, root system. So uh, that is why winter and fall and are kind of like important, uh, the important uh, seasons for the, the hydrangeas period, like all the hydrangeas, those are the important seasons. In winter, what they are doing, they're doing nothing, they are dormant. So when is the good time to prune? And I put it there, the good time to prune is actually winter. And I know I'm going against what you're gonna see and hear everywhere. But the thing is, if I go and prune in summer, I am actually cutting because in summer, they, in, in summer I am gonna be cutting the flowers and I'm gonna be cutting the growth. And a lot of the times my clients are like, but the plant looks so good. Why are you gonna prune it right now? I'm like, well, because they say so. Well, then if you cut in fall, you are disturbing what the plant needs to do. That is focusing and putting the hormones, the putting the hormones out and the nutrients, uh, store the nutrients in the in the root system. So, um, one of the other things that you want to keep in mind is fertilizing. 
when it comes to fertilizing, the best time to fertilize will be, well, the best times to fertilize will be summer and fall. Why? Because that is when the plant is already reaching for nutrients at the bottom for the flowers, for the flowers that they are going to produce next year and in fall because they are putting the energy in the root system. So that is when they need the nutrients the most. So in this case, I am going to go to my products right now. So I put the first product is the help, help, help. Um, this product, I put it um, there because it's the one that I use when I, I am fertilizing like new planted hydrangeas. New planted hydrangeas, that can mean I planted it and a month later I want to fertilize or two months later I want to fertilize. That is the fertilizer I use. I like it because one is liquid. I like it because two helps for the root system development and three, because it also helps for the, micro, the microbes in the soil. Um, and because it's liquid, it just absorbs really fast. It doesn't burn my, uh, my root system. Um, the other fertilizers that you have in your list, uh, or that you see here, are fertilizers that I use like in my maintenance. And I do it in summer and I do it in fall. The, I put them here um, for these are my selecting fertilizers because, um, well, you know, they are organic. They have uh, mycorrhizae, which is a uh, fungi that helps the plants getting water and nutrients out of the soil. Um, it helps for, they are slow releases fertilizers and they are not synthetic. So those are my favorites. And the one thing that I do want to kind of like call your attention on is the numbers. The, we call these like basic fertilizers. Uh, and basic doesn't mean that they are just like not smart enough, but more than they have, uh, the numbers are kind of like pretty close together. Which numbers I'm talking about? Every fertilizer have a set of three numbers. These three numbers are the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the uh, potassium. So these three numbers you want in the hydrangea to always be close together. Five, five, six, uh, three, two, three, five, five, five. It doesn't matter. You don't want a zero, zero, ten. You want to have all the time uh, like a basic fertilizer. Um, so these fertilizers um, also have uh, smaller numbers, like I am not putting here Maxine. Maxine is a really good fertilizer, it's liquid, but the thing is, it's a really strong fertilizer. The numbers are 16s and 13s, so it's a lot of it. So if I am going to, it's, it's, uh, it's really concentrated. So if I am going to put this fertilizer um you know, like in summer and fall, maybe if you want to fertilize, if your hydrangea is not doing good, it's better to fertilize more often and um, give it a little bit at a time instead of giving a bunch at once. So in this case, these fertilizers are better. Um, now, in fall pruning, if your hydrangea is showing a lot of uh, cold damage after winter, um, if your hydrangea, if hydrangea is showing um, not that many flowers and it's not related with pruning because you didn't even prune it because it had happened before. Um, so then two things that you want to use is the Epsom salt, like Epsom salt from, Epsom salt from the grocery uh, store. N simple thing. Um, and then, or you could use um, or you could use the CalMag that is a fertilizer that you find, you know, at Slots Garden Centers, any garden center. Uh, these are uh, elements, micronutrients that actually really help the plant produce flowers and uh, prevent uh, a lot of the um, cold damage in the plant. Um, so you could use them in fall when they are producing the flower for next year, if it's a late bloomer, um, and, it, 
and you also can go, um, you cannot hurt the plant with these two that I'm showing there. So it's uh, sometimes when I say get a, 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 a combination of magnesium and calcium, uh, sometimes they have the one that is with sulfur and you have to be really careful with that one because you can burn your plant. So I like these two and that's why I put them in your handout because those two, even if you made a mistake, you are not gonna damage your plant. Meaning make a mistake of putting too much. So now I put here on this side to the corner because you know I'm not being playing along a lot with the pH of the soil. Um, here is the solid uh, acidifier. Um, and this is the thing that you put for the blooms to get blue. You do have to be mindful of one thing that I want you to be super careful is this is something that it takes few years to happen. So that means you're gonna be putting a little bit at the time. Because what happens is if you change the pH of the soil too much, your plant is not gonna be able to flower. Um, your plant is not gonna be able to take certain nutrients like phosphorus, and that's why they don't flower. Um, so it is really important they become they start having like iron deficiency because you when uh, trying to make the soil acid too fast. So it is really important that you go, if you are using synthetic fertilizers to make your flowers uh, purple, just be mindful that you have to put a little bit at the time and maybe this will take two, three years. It's not something that your flower is pink, you put some and then it's blue. No, it takes few years. Turbo, stop. Um, so the, just to finish with the products, um, the other two products that I am putting here is the fungal disease, Turbo. Uh, sorry, that's my dog. The fungal disease um, and the, so there is a fungicide and something for the insects. Hydrangeas usually don't have a problem with none of that, but people keep asking me, what did you do? What do you use? What did you use? So these are the things I use. And I use this because they have um, a products that are, they don't stay in nature for long periods of time. So pretty much they wash out really quick. And so I put the fungicide if you are having problems with, um, some rust in your plants. Um, so then I do put, I put that in when it's dormant uh, and then I let it be. This fungicide is made with garlic. Um, also, you know, like I have dogs and animals or bees, you know, I'm really conscious of that. The deck bag is all, another one that um, I use this one because it's really soft too. So what do I mean with this, these two material uh, products? These two products, you may end up using them more often because they wash out easily. Um, but that is good for nature. Maybe it's a little bit more work for you, but it's good for nature. So those are the two materials that in case that you are um, having problem with your hydrangeas, which is really unusual, this will be two that I recommend. So now going back to pruning, um, the pruning of the hydrangeas, um, the one thing that I try to explain to people is um, have in mind what is the goal. Um, because like that, you can guide yourself in what really needs to happen. So a lot of the times uh, people say, I wanna prune because I want the flowers, I wanna produce flowers. Pruning do not produce flowers. The hydrangea will produce the flowers if you prune or not. Um, actually, if you prune too much, they will not produce flowers. That is totally true. So to control the size of the plant, and we are gonna talk about uh, how to control plants that overgrow the space because we plant the wrong plant and how to keep it up with that. Um, we are gonna talk about pruning in, as a maintenance in the sites as well. Um, but that is one of the goals. If that is your goal, then uh, keep it in mind when you're doing your pruning. To reshape. So this is the one goal that is really um, 
I keep in mind uh, for the hydrangeas, like the, the last series, the ones that produce flowers twice a year, um, because this reshaping is just a little bit here and a little bit. Is this selective pruning that you maybe cut three branches and move on to the next hydrangea? That is kind of like the reshaping of the plant I'm talking about. Um, removing three, the 3Ds. This is an important uh, step and goal that you want to do with every hydrangea in, in all the prunings that you do. So you always want to remove dead disease and damage. It's not necessary to leave it there. Um, and this will be a place where diseases actually can come in the plant. So if it's dead disease and damage, remove it. Um, deadhead the blooms, that is optional. Some people like to deadhead them. Some people like to keep them there all the way until they do the winter pruning. That is optional. Um, and, to, uh, and the last one is to invigorate the plant. So that is something that happens when you prune uh, in winter. Sorry that this, um, this uh, slide, this part of the slide, I don't know what's happening, but to invigorate the plant, the, uh, you want to do your pruning in winter. Um, and if that is your goal, so keep that in mind. Um, so it's any questions that uh, I can answer from what I explained, because then I'm going to go to more confusing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love the more confusing stuff, Elizabeth. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one of the questions, and I get this all the time. I just had a conversation with just this week, two separate people that were asking about coffee grounds as fertilizer. Um, and again, because of the acidity, I think it's a natural inclination to, you know, to think that, oh yeah, I can just, you know, dump coffee grounds and that should be sufficient. Do you mind speaking for a second on whether that actually is sufficient? And you know, if, if it is, what's the best way to do it? How often are we thinking? Is it is it something that is that you that, that's you know an equal to real fertilizer, which I don't think so, because it doesn't have, like you mentioned, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium. Um, but but again, just your thoughts on how and where and when using coffee grounds would make sense. Okay, so I do have to say that um, they are not, so coffee grounds will be something that will add acidity, yes. That is a complete fertilizer, no. But at the same time, it's a good fertilizer. I mean, if you make coffee, it's a, food, it's a good item to put in your, in, around your hydrangeas, yes, it is. Why? Because one, it is um, something that is going to help for the structure of the soil. Um, two, it's going to help for the acidity. The same thing with chicken manure. Somebody asked me, hey, what about chicken manure, cow, or horse manure? Like all those things will add to the acidity. And all those things will help too in the soil. However, this cannot be the only thing that you put in your hydrangeas because you need a lot of other things. So if you wanna put coffee grounds, because you know you make a lot of coffee, my sister makes lots of coffee, she could put coffee ground in her hydrangeas. And then maybe in fall, you can say, okay, now I put my regular fertilizer. So using organic matter to, to use in your plants to add a certain element, like we are adding uh, Epsom salt, organic matter. Um, this is good for um, one purpose and one purpose only. So you have to add the next step when it comes to that. So coffee grounds are not a fertilizer. They are just the one step for your acidity. And you can add, and uh, I do have to say that there is such a thing about adding too much coffee grounds, which it happens uh, to one of my uh, my clients once. I thought, no, it's okay, you can add. But I didn't know that they drink so much coffee. So when I came one, the plant was kind of like, you could see that they start having a deficiency, other nutrient deficiencies because the ground became too acid. So that is the part that becomes difficult when it's too much, when it's too little. Um, yeah, but I will say you can add it and it will add acidity, yes. 
it's not the only thing that you have to use. Okay, perfect. Um, and that makes sense because like we said, the the nice thing about the fertilizers that we're talking about are, you know, are that they they provide so many different elements and not just one, not just the acidity, um, which kind of brings me to one of the other questions that we're seeing a lot is just this whole idea of the soil acidifier, you know, turning hydrangea blue. When you, when you use the word acid and you look at it in terms of, you know, just providing general acid because they're acid loving, not all acid fertilizers will turn your plant, your hydrangea, your whatever blue. Um, what is it, you know, more about that one that changes the color or is there something specific to look at in your fertilizers if your desire is not to change the color? You know, you like them white, you like them pink, you like that kind of cool in between that you find sometimes with um, hydrangea. But why, why then use that soil acidifier if your plan is not to turn them blue or should you? Okay, well, um, yeah, so... At the beginning, what I was what I was thinking is okay. So let's talk about soil uh, pH. So if you plant your hydrangea and your hydrangea becomes is a little bit more in the alkaline, so it's opposite of acid. So your hydrangea is gonna have more of the pinkish colors. So if your hydrangea, if you plant your hydrangea and it's in the purplish color. So that means your uh, soil is a little bit more in the neutrals. And then if you plant your hydrangea and it goes kind of like in the pale, kind of like more uh, bluish, but not really blue, your, your soil is a little bit more into the acid. So people that really like that strong blue color, they are gonna go with something that is gonna add a lot of that acidity and that is gonna be kind of like more a little bit of that uh, aluminum sulfur. So, and that aluminum sulfur is the one that I'm a little bit hesitant to put it in your hangout because hand out because it can burn the plant. I have few people that did the calculation wrong, put too much, burn the plant, fully burn the plant. It can happen with one, if you put one time. So it's a one-time mistake that can kill the plant. However, that is what you're looking for. If you want your blue and not necessarily put in acidity, what you like, what you are looking for in your fertilizer is for aluminum sulfur. So that is a white thin, a like synthetic white. It looks like the Epsom salts, something like that. Um, you put it in water and you put it in your plant. Again, you want to do this transition really soft. The one thing, you don't want to use that to acidify your soil, soil. Why? Because when you change the pH of the soil, it's really hard to get it back. It's not that as simple as, oh, yeah, put lime, to pull lime or to pull a uh, cow. It's not so easy. Um, it takes a little bit of time, and it takes a little bit of time to balance again all the micronutrients. So if you want to acidify your soil, with, with, go with a fertilizer for acid-loving plants. If you want to change the color of your flower to be more blue, go with this, um, with this fertilizer for, to make the, that has aluminum sulfur. And you just have to put every year a little bit, every year a little bit, do not put that in the first six months after you plant your hydrangea. You wanna do that later on when your hydrangea had already have est established, it's already established. So don't put it in the first six months, I will say, because you could burn the, um, the new uh, root system. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um... Okay, two more questions, and then I'll, I'll let you get back to your flow. Apologies. Um, we were a lot of questions about, you know, this time of year, and it's been so humid and just lightweight disastrous for a lot of plants this year. Um, we've been talking about powdery mildew, and 
you know, whether at this time of year, and I, I've been answering saying, you know, it really kind of depends on what kind of hydrangea it is. If it's a hydrangea that normally goes dormant this type of, you know, this time of year, you know, it's kind of your call on whether you want to spray it with something. Um, if it's a uh, hydrangea, more like the oak leaf that you were talking about earlier, which doesn't necessarily go dormant in most places in the Bay Area, if that has powdery mildew, that's maybe more something that you want to treat. Um, do you have any thoughts on when, why, what are the circumstances under which you would go ahead and 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 treat it or whether you would just kind of let it pass, cut it off because it's already time for it to go dormant, et cetera, if you don't mind speaking to that. And then, like I said, I have one other question when you're done with that. And this is something that I often wonder because you, you recommend Epsom salt often. And the thought of it scares the death out of me because I just, I... <laughs> I'm worried that I'm going to OD on it. And I, I would love to be able to use it again. It is, you know, such a naturally occurring product. I would like to be able to. So just maybe a, a couple thoughts on exactly the best way to use Epsom salt. You know, I'm thinking nice warm water, soak your toes, but I imagine that for hydrangea and other plants, it's a little different. So maybe a first thought on how to deal with powdery mildew, when to treat and when to just let it go dormant. And then a couple thoughts on the Epsom salt. Yeah, great questions. So um, the first one, so powdery mildew is something that is gonna happen. Uh, and you say, yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you about deciding when to treat it and how. However, powdered mildew had a little bit more uh, that you have to think about it. Because even though you see it in the flowers, sorry, you see it in the leaves, it's also in the soil and it's also in the canes. So if you have powdered mildew in a plant that is already kind of losing their leaves and it's kind of yellow. So the one thing is if you don't want to treat, uh, so then make sure that you, you, you do your mechanical uh, step, which is pick up all the leaves, rake all that section, and then do your winter, uh, you, you, you can do uh, a, a winter spray, a dormant spray in the canes. That will be efficient enough really well efficient enough so but it is really important that you actually don't leave the uh, the powdery mildew leaves in the ground just pick them up clean it out if you don't want to clean it out so then put a really thick layer of mulch on top of that the powdery mildew um, sprays with the wind and the water so you don't want to leave those uh are sticking around too for too long and, and no, like freely fl flying around. So that is one. Two, um, you could spray, and, um, and you can spray right now the leaves that are almost dormant. It's not going to affect in anything. However, it's, I will say it's more efficient uh, for plants that go dormant to just wait, pick up the leaves, and then spray when it's fully dormant. And you can spray the soil and you can spray the leaves and you can spray with something like this fungicide I said, because you will just control that and um, and it will, um, yeah, it will not stick around and damage any anything else. Um, the other thing is you can do copper. So for example, if you do copper or uh, neem oil at the, when they are fully dormant, they are not bees going around. There is nothing that gets affected by these uh, products that you are using when they are fully dormant. With the semi-deciduous, the oak leaf hydrangea, you do wanna treat it and you wanna treat it. Um, and the one thing is that you are gonna have to treat it often. Um, not just one spray and let it go. You are gonna have to follow the directions of the product that you are using. And you want to make sure that this is sprayed at the top, at the bottom, and in all the canes and in the floor. And the reason why I'm saying that is, again, powdery mildew, where there is a powder. Imagine trying to control a powder. 
is really difficult. So what I do if I have a really bad case of powdery mildew in an oak leaf hydrangea is I actually defoliate the hydrangea, which means I am removing all the leaves of the hydrangea when it's the winter time. So it's cold enough, my hydrangea already produced the fall color, okay? So let's back up a little bit. My hydrangea is nice and green with the leaves and um, it's full of powdery mildew, full of powdery mildew. And so I am gonna try to control that. I am. I can spray right now or not. I may not want because of the bees and the flowers, okay? So then what I am gonna do is I am gonna let it produce the fall color. Fall color indi indicates to me that the plant is already preparing for winter. Uh, when it comes December, I am gonna remove all the leaves, all of them. And I am gonna spray everything, every little crack where the leaf is. I'm gonna make sure that has a dormant oil, a neem oil, anything or a, or a copper spray on the on the on the uh, oak leaf hydrangea i am gonna do it um at the beginning of the winter and or right after i do my pruning it doesn't matter the important thing is that you remove all the leaves you remove all the leaves from the ground you spray all the canes and you spray the ground as well um, and that is how you control something, uh, especially in that one, it's really difficult because it has a lot of places where the, where the powdery mildew can uh, stick to and overnight. So it is really important that you actually take the time to remove the leaves, the leaves that are in the plant. And it's easy to remove. You just go down and the leaves will break easily. So, and you want to do that in December and I spray that's what I will do. Um, for the other one, for the Epsom salt, yes, I'm sorry. I apologize for not being specific in how to use this Epsom salt. This Epsom salt is something I use because I realized it really helps the plants and I use it in a lot of things. <laughs> um, I use it in my citrus, I use it in my roses, I use it in, 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 in uh, every fruit tree um, and I use it in fall and in winter. And uh, the way I use it is really simple. Like actually the way I use it in my house is I do take a hot tub and instead of draining the hot tub, I just start putting that water in my plants. And that is how I water my plants. And in winter, you don't need to water your plants. No, but it, does, but it has the Epsom salt, so I do it. With my clients, however, it's not, if, if I have to do it, what I do is I use a bucket and I dissolve in a five gallon bucket, the one of those painting buckets, this, these buckets for the painting, five gallons, um, I put a cup and I dissolve it. And when I dissolve it, I put it in the plant. You know, like if, if, it's, a, it's, a, if it's an oak leaf hydrangea that is established or is a hydrangea that is established, meaning it grows to be five feet, six feet tall, I am gonna put the whole bucket on them. If it's a small hydrangea, like let's say that those are the hydrangeas that grow three feet tall, or they are really small and skinny. I put maybe half of the bucket um, on it. So, and I will do that twice, three times in the winter season. So um, that is how I use the Epsom salt. The good thing about the Epsom salt is that, you know, like I do do my trial and control tests. And I do have to say that the Epsom salt, the good thing is that let's say that you don't want to dissolve it and it's, a rain, it's raining. So then in that case, I go, I know it's going to rain and I just see me around buying 10, eight, eight bags of Epsom salt and I just sprinkle in the floor. I don't have to do anything. The dogs don't need it. Any of the uh, animals uh, hate it. Maybe the snails don't like it much. Um, which is not bad. And um, as soon as it rains, it gets dissolved. It dissolves really fast. So I do it in the packet. It's just because, you know, I don't want to just stand up there looking for the holes. No, just do it in the packet really quick, throw it, that's it. Um, 
So it's um I think that is one of the things that because I saw a lot of the people burning the plants with that sulfur, um, I decided to uh, to try the Epsom salt and the Epsom salt uh, works pretty well. And you have the possibility so you damage your plant with Epsom salt is going to be minimal. So that's why I do it. That seems perfectly reasonable. And again, a really easy way to, you know, to provide that some nutrition without, you know, having to buy a lot of products and having to remember what is what and when to use what that's, that's great. Epsom salt is, is super easy then. Um, I don't have any other questions that are standing out right now. Is there anything that you want to hit again before we, before we move on? Um, no, no, not really. <laughs> it's so much information. I mean, and it's, which is my favorite thing about these webinars is that there's just so much and so much to, you know, learn and so many things that are transferable just because we're talking about hydrangea, you know, today doesn't mean that we're not going to have, you know, other plants and other things that we can kind of transfer some of the same information to. So, so no, that that's awesome. I will, I will let you move on. Um, we're coming right up about on our hour. So let's, let's get to pruning right quick. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, so the gen this is the general pruning. So what I did for the, for this seminar is, uh, or this webinar is that I am going to do general pruning steps. And then I am going to give you a little of the specifics for few of the hydrangeas in this general pruning, you are going to, uh, if you, if you, do it uh, yourself and you are going to learn from it and you're going to see this actually the easiest way to maintain and care for the hydrangeas, the pruning side. Um, so the one thing is that is really important about this general pruning is that the general pruning, I am basing it in having the pruning in winter. So what do I mean with winter pruning? The winter pruning is December to February. Um, usually I prune it close to February, March, uh, just because I don't want these plants to have any frost uh, problems. However, if I have one of my clients that I have in December, in this, I have with maples and all fruit trees I do, I go and do the hydrangeas right away. And if that will be December, December is good. As soon as the hydrangea is fully dormant, that is a good time to prune. So the first thing, the first step, and sorry that this um, is also, um, the writing is one on top of the other one. But the first cut is cut the three Ds. The three Ds are something that I'm really glad that I'm hitting everywhere because this is part of making the regular maintenance and the health of the plant um, a easier, is regular maintenance easier and better for the health of the plant. Um, so cut the dead, the three Ds are dead, cut the dead, the disease and the damage. So a lot of the times I will go by like, yeah, cut the dead disease and damage, let's go. No, rule number two. But what happens is people keep asking me, how do I cut the dead disease and damage? So this is the thing. You cut the dead, you have options. You can cut all the way to the base of the plant. So you go all the way down and cut it there. This is good. And this is good if you do it in winter. Why? Because that is how you invigorate your plant. All this, all this, um, canes or stems that you go all the way to the base of the plant and cut them there, they are going to come back and they are going to grow from the base of the plant. So you are doing a little bit of rejuvenation when you are doing that. So don't be afraid of cut these three days. Um, then you have, the, you can also cut to the main stem. And when we are talking about kind cut to the main stem is, I have some things here. So cutting to the main stem means you have your main stem and you have a secondary stem coming from it. So you can cut right at uh, cutting to the main stem is you can cut right to the point of growth. So I'm cutting to the main stem. If this is broken, I will cut here. If this is dead, I will cut here. Um, that is going to help also 
clear out all this extra growth you don't need. So cutting above a set of buds. So I have here uh, two buds that are not fully developed. It doesn't matter if they are not fully developed. Just try to find some sort of buds, that little connection, and you are gonna cut right above that. Um, this picture shows cutting all the way to the base of the plant. This picture shows cutting right above the stem. So you can do that, and those are gonna be your three Ds. That that's the first step. That is gonna clear out a lot of stuff. Now, the second, the second um, quick, this needs to be quick. It's not, it, you don't have to think too much. If it's a little broken, if it's dark, if it's bended, cut it. So the other one, the, uh, is the second step is removing the weak, spindly stems. Again, you can cut it all the way to the bends, you can cut it to the stem. We already talked about it. But one of the things that people also always ask me is what is spindly? What is weak? Weak is something that is not up and out, you know, like general like. That is a strong. Weak is something that grows like this, kind of like curvy, like they don't know where they are going. Maybe this way, maybe the other one. This is an example of weak as well. So you can see how thin this is compared with this one, how thick one it is. So when I think about weak, I am thinking thickness. I am, I don't want canes that are thinner than a, a pencil thick. I want something, I don't want a canes that are leaning down in the floor. So in this picture, I'm showing this picture from the back side of the hydrangea, showing you a weak cane that contains, what happens with that weak cane? The cane was thick enough, was pencil thick, but what it generates? It generates a lot of other weak stems, spindly stems. So I right away wanna cut that one. Like it doesn't matter if the, if the cane was a pencil thick, it's not going up and out. You want your canes. If you wanna know which canes you wanna keep, you wanna keep the canes that are going up and out, up, up and out in any situation. So that should clear out a lot of the, a lot of um, the canes out of your uh, hydrangeas. So now, step number three, and this is the, the step that gets a little confusing because you want to look at your structure. Um, you want to generate a structure. And what do I mean with a structure? A structure, this picture which is, is telling you what the structure is. So right now I have done uh, the, the, this section um, of the hydrangea. Uh, the section close to the red. Um, well, the red in the in the slide, not this red stick. So anyway, what I am meaning with the structure is I am generating some framework. I am generating some main scaffolds. And this is gonna help me with my hydrangea in many ways. This is gonna help me with my hydrangea in the reduction if I wanna uh, keep my hydrangea smaller. This is gonna help me with my hydrangea if I want the hydrangea to be able to hold the flowers up. Um, this is gonna help me in the maintenance of the hydrangea. So this is gonna help me for a, the have good air circulation. So general strong frame. How do we need to do, how do we generate this strong frame? By removing all the dead disease and damage and by removing all the weak uh, stems and also we are gonna look at thinning out the, the center. So what you wanna make is a base of V shape structure. Everything is gonna go again up and out. And so you're gonna remove crossing, crowding and competing. So and this is something that if you regularly look at your hydrangea, like yearly look at your hydrangea, you are gonna start learning what a structure is. And then you're gonna say, oh my God, at the beginning it takes time to figure it out. But when you look at it, now I know what it is. And now I know how to 
easily clean it because it makes your maintenance easy. So this is the don't. A lot of the times when I go to my clients, this is a hydrangea that is pruned. Yes, it's pruned every year and it's maintained every year, but they don't do any of the thinning. They are not generating a structure. So this is what we don't wanna do. What we wanna do is if I have a hydrangea that is, this is my regular, I wanna go and generate the other, this one here. So this one in the left side um, of your screens had all the canes that grew last year, had growth at the top, had good, uh, spindly growing horizontal. None of that is something I want. I want to simplify my framework, my structure, so like that I can have pruning, I can have flowers every year, and I can have new canes every year. So usually that's what I do. So the thinning out is by cutting all the spindly, by leaving all the strong and thick, and the ones that are going up and out. So now, I talk about, okay, let's say that you did all that, but it's still really, really thick. So one of the things I wanted to try to show you here is what do I mean with the three C's? The three C's is something that helps you clear out um, some of these canes that are not easy to identify. So the first is crossing. So for example, in this yellow one, I have two branches that are crossing. And in this case, it's about selected. You select one, leave the other one. Which one is better? You know what? Right now, it's just make a choice. So in this case, you can leave this one in the center, um, or you can cut the center right here and leave that one. It doesn't matter. It's a hydrangea. They are pretty forgiven, and you are going to see um, later on if it was a good or bad idea or it's going to come out right anyway. Um, the important thing is that you solve it. There is another yellow here, another arrow here that shows this, this cane. This cane is coming from here, going all the way, crossing this way. That is crossing. So pretty much you are going to find hydrangeas that are going to have a lot of crossing because they go they are opposite uh, growth. So you're going to have canes that are going to grow inside the plant. If they grow inside the plant, that means they are going to cross something. So that is going to be crowding the plant. You are going to remove it. So remove this one as well. So now um, you have these ones here. These ones are competing. There is one cane that is growing at the same place of the other cane, really close together. You want to generate a space between canes so because they are going to produce, this cane is going to produce secondary canes. So if you have two close together, it's going to be too much. So you want to remove one. Which one do I remove? It doesn't matter. Just remove one. If you want the plant to grow taller, remove the lower section. If you want the, one, the plant to be shorter, so then remove the top one. If you want your plant, if you want to keep a strong case, well, remove the thin one. If you are trying to slow down your hydrangea, so then remove the thick one. Those are the options. Last one, crowding. Uh, over here, you have two branches that are this main branch and this main branch or cane. This main cane and this main cane. Both of them are part of the main structure. They are already there. They have been there for a few years. I already did the pruning in this one and the pruning in this one last year. I didn't solve it last year for X, Y, or J. Well, now I'm going to solve it because I can see that this is interfering. This is generating a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of problems, uh, more crowding at the top. So I am gonna remove from these two green ones, I'm gonna remove one. Which one I'm removing? Most probably I'm gonna remove the one at the top. Why? Because this one has a lot of canes that um, are strong and nice and lower, so that's gonna help me. So to complete the thought, if I come and start with the pruning of the green arrows, so I remove this one. So then what I'm going to do is I am going to remove this yellow cane here that is going upwards because I already have this structure here. So then I'm going to have this structure going and then maybe I remove the lower here. 
So that is my train of thought. In any case, you do have options. Just pick up your mind. And the simple, uh, the simple rule of thumb is cut the one in the middle, cut the one in the middle, cut the one in the middle, and that cut the one in the middle, and that will thin out your structure, your main scaffolds. So in this, uh, in this uh, picture, you are gonna have, this is the microphylla, and this is the paniculata. One of the things about it that I wanna show with this one is that by looking at your structure, you can actually reduce your hydrangea. Um, a, like this one, for example, is a fence that is three feet tall fence. And I reduce my hydrangea quite a lot. And because I do this pruning every year, I have new canes, I have old canes, I have last year canes, I have all the canes. So I am for sure having flowers no matter which hydrangea it is. The same thing with this one. This one is a hydrangea paniculata. I want, what is the goal of this? I The goal of this one is I have a fence. This is a six foot fence and I want my hydrangea to be even taller than the fence. So every year I cut it closer to the fence, closer to the height of the fence. So like that, I generate a lot of flowers, but I don't have all the flowers at the top. Why? Because I have a lot of canes at the bottom. So what I do is I generate my structure. You can see these are canes that have been there for three, four years. But what happens is I have canes in the lower section. So there is always a rejuvenation. When I cut one of these big old canes at the bottom, because I don't know, they broke or something or some you know the ball broke it so then what i'm gonna do is i cut it all the way to the bottom i am gonna have really strong canes coming right from that point and that is my rejuvenation um so that is how you can cut you can have an oak leaf hydrangea or a paniculata anyway producing flowers even though you are not uh, fully cutting it so much um, the other one. So now we go to specifics. And these are the specifics to control the size. So let's talk about you have a huge hydrangea that is in your path and you want to control a size. So one of the tricks I give you is this one. When you are, um, the hydrangeas have opposite buds, means one is right next to the other one in the opposite way. So what happened is usually the hydrangea will produce flower in one and not in the other one. So when you are, if I am trying to control a hydrangea that's usually six feet tall and I have to keep it four feet or three feet tall, which is really hard and it's still flowering. So one of the things I wanna do is I wanna go and do, I wanna do two prunings. So one of the prunings I'm gonna do is, remember I'm trying to keep the flowers. So one of the prunings I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do May to June pruning. And May to June is that I wanna be able to see where the flower is. So the flower should be there or the flower is halfway opening. At that time, I say my client call me. So when they call me, you are gonna, I go and look for the cane that is not gonna produce a flower and that is the one I cut. And I cut in May or June. And what is I am doing is I'm controlling the height of the canes that are not gonna produce flowers that year, which they will produce next year because I'm cutting at that time of the year. Well, okay, maybe that was a little confusing, but let's put it this way. If this cane is produced, so right now in the in the in this a uh, picture with the flowers, you can see that there are some canes with some foliage that doesn't have flower. Over here, there is another foliage that doesn't have flower. So those are the canes that I'm gonna go and reduce. And uh, it's 2000 uh, 2003, and well, actually, if it's 2003, I come in May in June 2003 and reduce them. Because I am reducing them in the growing season, these plants are going to produce some green growth. So I am going to 
eh, those are gonna branch out, meaning they're gonna produce two uh, other uh, canes. These canes are not gonna produce, all this growth is gonna be vegetative. So, but what is gonna do? This is gonna, this is gonna, uh, in, and then I go in winter and in winter and I reduce them a little bit more. When I reduce them in winter, I'm leaving some of these buds in there. I, I leave two, three buds in the stem. So meaning um, if this is my stem in winter, you have a set of buds here, a set of buds here, a set of buds here. So then I come and cut here. I have, if this is my stem in winter, so I go, one set of bats, two set of bats, three set of bats, I'm gonna cut here. So that is what I do. Uh, and that gives me the opportunity to reduce it, but I still have last year growth in my hydrangea. Um, I put a red note here about do not use this in the microphylla that produces the flowers, two time flowers a year. Um, I put it there knowing that it's kind of like an overstatement because usually those plants that produce two flowers a year are really slow growers. So you are not gonna do it, but I put it there for peace of mind. Um, specific for the Kersifolias. The one thing about the Kersifolia that I see over and over and over is that people go and cut them really, really hard. I want you to generate a structure. Yes, this is the structure for the paniculata that I showed you before, yes. But you are gonna treat it the same way. You are gonna generate a framework, you are gonna generate canes, and you are gonna simplify it um, and remove skinny stuff that cannot hold the flower. If you want your hydrangea to look like this picture with the flower, where the flower is up, that is what you need to do. Stop pruning your hydrangea really hard in winter because this is gonna make the, uh, the canes to shoot out really strong, but they are not um, a, a strong enough to hold such a big flower. So they end up kind of like going upwards. So you don't wanna do that. You wanna generate a structure. You wanna kind of like slow down with the pruning, meaning do not cut too strong your hydrangea because strong pruning strong reaction. And for this hydrangea in specific, it becomes really weak. Um, not becomes really weak, but it it shoots out a canes that are so long, they are too flexible, and they are not able to hold the hydrangea up. Okay, so I'm done with my thing. You guys have any questions? <laughs> It's so much information. It's it's just so much information. Um, I have one quick question. I know we're getting super, super late and I promise I'm gonna let you guys get back to your Saturday. Um, let's see here. Well, one of the things I do wanted to say is that in any case that you guys need to leave, the seminars are in the website, a slow website, and you can go back and finish looking at the, uh, at, looking at the uh, webinar later on. For sure. I mean, yeah. So this today, Saturday, this one will be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel by Tuesday. So you can take some time, go back through, get on the sections that maybe you missed. Um, fast forward, rewind, et cetera, et cetera. One quick question. Um, and again, like I said, I'll let everybody go. You, you talked a little bit about deadheading earlier and the, you know, and the, and you said, and, and I could have heard it wrong or seen it wrong also, that you were saying not to deadhead in some cases, just to let those, you know, those spent blooms hang there. When is the best time or is it, when is it okay to do deadheading, you know, under normal circumstances for most plants? You deadhead when the when the blooms are spent so that it can help generate new new blooms and give new life and 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 you mentioned I think like I said I may have heard it wrong um, not to deadhead and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah, so the, I think that deadheading is up to your preference. Uh, some people like to keep the flowers there. They think that those dry flowers are beautiful. The one good thing about keeping the flowers if is 
is if your plant is a little bit tender to cold to to the cold weather, this will protect your plant, those flower the dead flowers there. But this will be like, you know, if you are talking about hydrangeas in Tahoe um, or something like that. Uh, if the the best time to dead ahead, um, I will say is when you are seeing your plants kind of like um, uh, your flowers drying, semi-drying is a good time uh, to dead ahead. If you, for example, you have a plant that is kind of like weak, so like ha it's producing really thin stems. Like I have my hydrangea is producing these stems. So it's still too weak. I want big canes, big stems. So I try to deadhead earlier in the season. Uh, and um, so like that, the stems are not bending over, holding the, the, the flower. Um, but really, really went to deadhead anytime that you want to. Some people use the flowers and so they want the flowers fresh and nice. So then they they dead head way earlier. Um, if you wanna be like precise, you know, engineer size precise. So I will say October is a good time to dead head. It's, okay. the, the flowers are kind of like there, but not really. Um, some are good, some are bad. October. All right. Perfect. And then is that, would you say that's true also if you are transplanting? If you're moving a hydrangea from one location to another, whether it's in the yard or whether you're taking it out of a, let's say it had been potted in a container up until now, and now you actually want to, you know, put it in the ground. Is there a best time of year to do that movement? Oh, okay. So that is like transplanting. Yeah. So when you are planting or transplanting, uh, planting, um, I will say planting something from the top to the ground, uh, any time is good. Uh, however, you have to realize that if you plant in the summer, so then there is uh, more care that you have to put on it because you have to put more water, you have to protect the plant maybe from the sun. Um, the easiest time to do the moving is right now, October, November, I do a lot of my planting, a lot of my transplanting um, because it, especially planting from a pot uh, to the ground because it gives the plant the opportunity to still establish with the soil being warm and the temperatures being warm. Uh, if you are gonna transplant something um, that is has been there for a long time and you are like actually digging it out of the soil, uh, let's say that is a oak leaf hydrangea that is planted in the wrong place. So in that case, I will um, I will uh, try to wait like a little bit more towards November. And the only reason is because the more um, the more opportunity I give the plant to give to put energy in the root system, the most probabilities I have the plant to come back strong next year. So I try to move my transplanting into more of the dormancy period for plants that are deciduous.